hold on one sec because yeah. you're giving us all this gem and we got yeah. we, we haven't started yet so yeah, yeah i'm like this guy i i have so many questions for you. Oh, so um, much. Uh, so if you're cool then i'm just gonna jump into it and i'll just, right I'll just well, give you the wings man yeah. so just, just real quick addict athlete we are just a group of people who are now starting to get to see like hey i'm done with that old lifestyle and i'm done just sitting around in a circle i want to do something for recovery action no more anonymous no more anonymity we're not we're not powerless over our addictions that we can train ourselves to be powerful over them um, and so really you're talking to a bunch of new people and a lot of people who are exactly where you were when they dropped you off for treatment. They're like, do I need this? So I kind of wanted to dive yeah. into, you know, it's cool that you're bringing this topic up because I've always wanted to do this, but like you said in the past, there's people like, like us who, I mean, Utah, we, we're like, like everybody else. We have hundreds of, of treatment centers in Everywhere. here. There are a couple of good ones and there's a lot of bad ones. I want to talk a little bit about your experiences there and kind of your, yeah. your parents, because I mean, your parents dropped you off having no clue what was yeah. going on in what there. What do people so, look for? Oh, if you're yeah. cool, we'll just run down those situations and those scenarios. I'll just kind of. Yeah, absolutely. And then just like, you know, for, I don't know if you've seen it. And myself, I ended up uh, on methadone and which the doctors had told my parents, an addicted addiction specialist, he called himself, this was before they had the actual addictionology specialist. First, he gave me Norco. Uh, uh, okay. That's still Vicodin. It's still hydrocodone. Like, just because yeah. it's called Norco, it's, it's just semantics. The same but thing, like, yeah. Then he moved me to methadone. Oh, I went off the hook with methadone. And my yeah. mm -hmm. I, my, my dosage was absurd. To mm -hmm. the, Ford was like, we don't, we won't take, we won't detox him. Nobody would detox me. Some sketchy place in California took me on Laguna Beach just because they wanted the money. But it took yeah. 30 days to detox me from methadone. Some guy who admitted he only had 260 days sober was my counselor. Then he, he did the perfect move. He inserted himself between my mom and I, who had yes. signed power of attorney over. So I, I read that. I heard that house. about you. Ooh. So she could sell my house. I had signed uh. power of attorney. He talked her into cutting me off. I couldn't get back into my own money. I couldn't get into anything. It was the AA thing. Cut him off with everything. Screw him. Dangerous. He, bro he brokered me. Patient yes. brokered me to a sober home where I saw heroin for the first time. The sober home manager was dealing crystal meth, and the house got raided. I was just like, you know what, man? Again, yeah, it's the same. World. It's the same story. I mean, I, I lost a very special person uh, on the team, and she passed away about at our sober living house. And I'm like, where are you, the staff? Where? I mean, oh my, we'll, we'll get into. It. Let's just jump right, into this, cool. okay? Yeah. All right, here we go. In three, two, one. Athletes, take your mark. Get set. It's time for the Addict to Athlete podcast. Everybody out there, thank you so much for downloading, subscribing, and sharing this podcast with anyone that may be struggling with any kind of addiction. Uh, on Team Addict to Athlete, it doesn't matter what uh, it is that's been causing your life's problems. We are here to help, and you've got a team behind you. Athletes, I want to turn your attention to our website for all kinds of information, specifically with our new store and uh, some uh, messages of hope and some uh, resources that could be used uh, for all walks of life throughout any kind of addiction. So jump on to addicttoathlete.org and uh, jump on there and see what, uh, what we have that might help. I want to give a special shout out and thanks to our Patreon subscribers. And thank you for all that you Patreon subscribers do. Athletes, I'm excited today. We have a very special guest on that we, we've tracked down through LinkedIn, which is kind of interesting. I didn't know, I'm still kind of new to some of the, that, that stuff. And, and uh, when I was reading some of uh, our guest posts, I thought, man, this guy's heart's beating the same rhythm that ours are. And unbeknownst to me, Marissa had already been kind of, uh, you know, texting and messaging back and forth through LinkedIn and whatnot. But we are happy to have Ryan Ward on the podcast today, who has a very unique and special insight into the world of addiction treatment centers of MAT and about ways that uh, I think the whole system needs to be revamped and changed or, or else we are probably headed for a, a horrible downfall. So Ryan, thank you so much for being, uh, for being willing to jump on here, even though we had some crazy fiascos about getting you the link to even jump on here. Um, but would you mind sharing with the listeners a little bit about who you are? And, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you right now, the stuff that we just talked about before we were, we got rocking and rolling, I'm putting into this podcast because you, you're just full of gold. So Ryan, introduce yourself to, to Team Addict to Athlete. Great. Well, I, first, thank you so much for having me on. Um, like we were saying before, I really, what you guys are doing is great. It inspires people. It gives them hope. And that is what you need. Yeah. We're like 100 episodes into this stupid thing. We're still feel like amateurs, you know. I love it. That's the way it rolls. You know what? I watched one of your episodes today. It's you guys do a really good work. It's impressive. Oh, 
<laughs> Thank you. I wasn't familiar with before, you know, you, you had emailed me. I'd seen Marissa on LinkedIn and yeah. uh -huh. I, uh, I, I was, it was so cool. I watched, I had to write his name down to remember it, but yeah. Uh, yeah. your interview with Mishka, the, the yes. Blue Robinson did that with Mishka and then another yeah. one about, about pain. Yeah, like you had done the one with the, and then another one about just enduring pain, and it was just yeah. they were both good. It wasn't an interview; it was just talking about enduring. Yeah. Pain. Oh, cool! It was just things that I hadn't thought of myself, to tell you the truth. But I, I wholeheartedly agreed, and I was like, "That's yeah, yeah, that yeah. yeah, yeah." Yeah, reading some of your stuff on LinkedIn, I was like, "We are on the same page. Oh, we need to get this guy on." Seriously, like, like very much agree on a lot of things. Yeah. Oh my goodness. You know, just again, like I, I saw some of the stuff. You'd ask a couple of questions, and I'm, you know, we we have owned uh, our treatment center much like what you have done, and the same thing kind of pushed us out with some people that were doing some shady stuff, and well, and some um, of it was just they just wanted to do the bare minimum, you know, because that's what's easy yeah. and you get yeah. paid the exact same, no matter what quality of care you give. And we were like, no, we give a high quality of care, but that takes a lot of work. Yeah. Oh yeah. So, it does. Yeah. And we yeah. Some counselors that literally would say, I work nine to five after five, do not call me. I'm like, so if your client's standing on top of the roof, you know, saying he's going to jump, don't call you. Like you're not sweating yeah. that, you know, like, yeah. obviously yeah. I want, but you get my point. It's like, absolutely. It's like, no, I'm, I'm off duty. I'm like, you don't get it in this job. Like you don't do it for the money, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, unless you're doing fraudulent, then you're doing it for the money. Yeah. But like you're doing it for the love of the job. So you're on duty, whether you like it or not, you got to keep yeah. six clients. You can handle them, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, yeah. And if you're doing, if you're doing your job nine to five, They'll never be standing on top of the roof. So let's be honest, right? I'm I mean, like, do addicts just do nine to five? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I wish. Well, yeah. the, a little bit about yeah. addict to athlete. We're a nonprofit group. We started about to about 10 years ago now. And it was when I was working with a government program, being a, I was a therapist and, and counselor. And uh, they didn't have anything else in our community other than 12 steps. And for some of my clients, it just wasn't gelling with them. And so I knew that health and recreation kind of helped me erase the addiction, replaced it with like, you know, things of greater value like health and wellness and something else to talk about other than just talking about, you know, addiction. And so it kind of started off from that. My Marissa is a rec therapist. And so it fit that, that kind of, kind of uh, mindset. And good marriage of us. <laughs> it's really kind of just been a hobby for the last, you know, 10 years until we left the, you know, the treatment centers world. And I'm like, I think we can probably do this a lot better using our philosophies and metaphors than yeah. trying to fit that typical model, which I think is so cutthroat and broken. And so mm -hmm. that's what we're doing full time. Well, now. And our, our program is, it is that community support group. We're trying to create some other options now too, and looking at even just an online recovery program here yeah. at the first of the year that people yeah. can do on their own. And I saw the thing because athletes for art or at addicts to addict artists. to artists. Yeah. Yeah. That was interesting. Yeah, that yeah. Interesting. And we just uh, want to be able to create just that long-term connection with people because it's not in the treatment center, even if it is a good one, it's not yeah. where the real change comes about because it's just so micro so small. that you've got to have that community, you know, and that sober support system that we try to do this as a real yeah. good long-term connection. That's, yeah. you know, an alternative for people to the 12 steps. It's so, so crucial and something else that I don't even know if you guys can realize it, but see, I, I can't run. I've had so many surgeries. I, I lift weights every day, but shock impact hurt me mm, more. Yeah. To tell you the truth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm, 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 I'm a cyborg. I'm lucky to be walking. But yeah. yeah. But what you were saying about it being, you know, driving and that 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 drive and that impact and that 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 so that, that team support because I grew up playing every sport in the book, so I was used mm -hmm. to being team captain and and leading and, and, and being motivated and having ho hope. I always had hope. I was always an optimist. Mm -hmm. I, I, unlike a lot of people, it was really because I, I don't have a, 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 the same story as a lot of addicts, like the family trauma and all that. Like, dude, my family yeah. was straight Brady Bunch. I was yeah. a spoiled kid who grew up <laughs> in a closed private school environment, totally needed the humbling that I got. Don't get me wrong, but yeah. Like I had no trauma. So like my first, when I went to college, I went to a good college. I majored in economics. I partied like a rock star, lived in the frat house. If I had huh. the gene on the day I graduated, I, I went to work and I worked my butt off to make money. And that was yeah. my addiction, you know? And like, that Absolutely. was it. And I do have an addictive personality just cause I'm type A, and I, you know, one's yeah. good, two's better, you know, like, and I'm 110% ADD. So I always want to be doing a bunch of things and thriving. Mm -hmm. 
I heard you say it earlier. Too, <laughs> yeah. I appreciate yeah. it. And that's what <laughs> multitask. You're controlling it. Just do multiple things. You give yeah. them exactly. one fail. But uh, the, the, the having the hope, and that's what you guys give is, is hope, and having, you know, having something to strive for. And yeah. one of the things that your organization that did, and I wish I'd found it before, was I'd had so many back surgeries that I'd gained. I'm, I'm six, I was six five, and now I'm down to six four with oh. all my surgeries. Dang. But I'd gone from being a you know big linebacker, meathead who was in the gym all the time, always the alpha male, to being fat, out of shape, and if I wrestled with a three year old, I was gonna be sore because <laughs> exactly, okay? yeah. So and, and it got so frustrating that. And 2000, you know, after even addiction, it was, I was still just so fat. I was depressed and I had realized that I had first, when I first broken my back, they were just under medicating me, not giving me enough for the pain meds. I was a good mm-hmm. guy and I had a natural tolerance. I'd like, I've never, I never have blacked out on alcohol. I've drank mm-hmm. a fifth of whiskey and been fine. And just yeah. because my body metabolizes weirdly or whatever, I, I, don't, yeah. know. I don't know, but the, the Vicodin didn't work. And my first surgeon just gave me Vicodin for two years straight before he could admit that he had screwed up the surgery. And I was mm. at age 27. He didn't want to admit he shouldn't have done the surgery in the first place either, yeah. which is a major fusion on a 27-year-old that's healthy. Oh like, no. do some, like, physical therapy. Go see you. But he didn't, I didn't go to PT. Like, it was straight, wow. full-on, double-layer fusion. Let's and do a big back a surgery. Driver, so it broke. The metal broke in my back. Oh my gosh. I, yeah. So I'm like, so I, I'm start getting to a point where I get depressed and this is where I can, I'm, I'm able to reflect back on it and understand it now because mm-hmm. my first two years, I didn't like, I didn't feel painkillers. Like I would take them because it hurt, but I was still trying to be the tough guy. So like, I don't need them. But yeah. then after a couple of years, I was like, why do I keep getting sick? Like I need to yeah. get sick. Now I get the flu every week. Well, you know, but I didn't understand Viking was, was in my drawer and I'm pouring and sweat and sick, and I had no clue I was an after-school special. No idea. Perfect. I had to yeah. Google it myself and figure out. I was like, I'm a drug addict. Like, yeah. You're like, These are you when did this happen? Yeah. 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 I was like, I'm not, I've never even seen heroin. I've done coke in college, but like, like you know, it was I could never do it more than one night. You know, it was like hell. Yeah. I don't want to see it again, you know, like it hurts. And I was Seriously. like, so I, I just didn't get it. But then once I got to the point where I was fat, I'd stopped going out. I went out one person. I couldn't go out. It wasn't fun to go out anymore because it hurt. <laughs> Everything hurt. So I just, I made enough, I was successful. So I, bad timing, I bought a house. And this was right before the market bust too. So I bought yeah. this nice house in Richmond, Virginia. I'm rolling in it. I'm arrogant as can be, but I'm in a ton of pain. And I'm like house on that show they used to have yep. walking around the office, popping Percocet. Like they're like literally like Skittles. And I yeah. literally got to the point where I was taking about 70 tens a day. Just the uh, Tylenol alone should have yeah. been Not Good, the, yeah. part, screw the opiate part. Cause you, there's no ceiling to that tolerance. Right. Yeah. Functioning, perfectly functioning. And that's uh, what it took to function. So I, my parents finally stepped in and were like, they realized it too. And some of my friends started realizing it, like how I was isolating, which wasn't like me and like right. parking my Tahoe down the street. So people wouldn't know I was home. And like, dude, like that just wasn't me. Science so a couple man. of my good friends called my parents and I have, a, I was a real mama's boy and my mom knew right away. All right. So, she, you know, right off the bat, they sent me to some place that was local in Virginia and I walk in and I walked out in 10 minutes. They were chanting, and the woman asked me, a counselor, and she knew this was my first experience, and, and it's an AA or highway place. What's your goal? I said, I want to be able to go out and drink with my friends again. And I, I was dead serious. I yeah. just want to be – what, what that was meaning was I want my friends again. I want to be yeah. social again. Yeah. And, but the word drink just – I want to be able to go to bars with my they friends just, again. And she laughed at me. And, and then the whole room just laughed. They're like, you'll never have another drink a day in your life. And I looked at her, and I got up and walked out. <laughs> oh, young, yeah. Yeah. AMA right there. I was like – you're Perfect. all crazy and you can shake your shakes and do your chants or whatever this they were doing yeah. a serenity prayer but see but you don't do that you don't just throw someone face first in a fire like that like so Man. wrong in every way they'd already swapped my insurance card they didn't care they got there yeah. two weeks or whatever and let them walk out the door holy right? cow right yeah, no good the orientation Thank you. without a doubt i mean there's this the, the there's the you know the process of relapse there's the process of you know, the, what they say, the pause and the, you know, getting the drugs out of your system. 
getting mm -hmm. themselves to a, a basic foundation so they can figure out if it's depression, bipolar, whatever it is that they may need to treat or maybe not need to treat with medication, then giving you the next level of treatment, whatever that be. And you have to have that support around you, you cannot have people judging you around you, most yeah. importantly. And people that are just telling you this way or that way is wrong or this or that is wrong. And I have nothing against AA. The mm -hmm. one thing I did disagree with is we are all terminally unique. We are all unique. We might yes. all end up in the same place from doing the same things, but we are all unique. We respond differently to medications. We respond yeah. differently to trauma. We, we all have different reactions. So that's why when we were talking before, I was like, and I, I don't necessarily, maybe I, I do probably believe that, that alcoholism is a gene. I don't know if I necessarily had that gene. Uh, right. Like I was telling you, I took pain meds for two years. I didn't, I didn't like them. It's, I didn't dislike them. And they didn't make me feel sick. I didn't feel anything from them. I yeah. was having surgery. I took the meds the doctor gave me. That yeah. was it. But once I became depressed, I got fat. I'd always been an athlete. I'd always been safe. I started self-isolating. I got very depressed. And that was back in the day when I thought depression and anxiety were things people made up. <laughs> That's yeah. me mine. Exactly. Your head. That's all I thought, you know, mm -hmm. I was like, just be, just smile and be happy. Yeah. Why not? You Get know, over it. Alive. Like be happy. I finally got it. I was like, I'm sick now. I'm, you know, 300 pounds. I'm fat. I'm out of shape. I, you know, I have friends, but they, they want to hang out. I don't want to go hang out. It hurts, you know, I just want to sit here and take pain meds. And yeah. That's when I started taking, I realized if I took a whole lot, I, it's not, I didn't really got euphoria, but I could at least almost sleep. And it's not even like they really helped the pain. They just disassociated my brain from yes. dealing with it. You know, well, yeah. and, and, and your crap you're, that was dealing up with behind it. Your pain came from a surgery that you had at a young age, which is uh, which is super intense. I mean, you were in your your mid twenties when you had back surgery. Yeah, twenty seven. I had a surgeon, a scalpel jockey, who was surprisingly enough a, a neighborhood friend of my parents, oh, and man. was known as one of the top neurosurgeons. Unfortunately, it'd be like drafting Brett Favre today. <laughs> Done. Okay, you don't want to, like, he's not, like, I'm back in football, Brett Favre, come on. You're my, Put me in, coach. NFL, yeah. ah, mm -hmm. His days are done, okay? So this yeah. guy, he needed to continue to pay for his Ferrari collection and his white shopping habits. So anybody that walked in there, he was known for just doing 10 of these fusions a day. And they can make had, so much money. All these lawsuits, he failed all the time, but he was so old that he screwed up, didn't know how to use a screwdriver. So for two years, instead of just saying, hey, I screwed up your surgery, you need to come and see, get another MRI, see what's next, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Here's Vicodin. Here's, here's more Vicodin. You need to up, up your dose. Two years before, like I told you guys before, I yeah. didn't understand why I was getting a flu once a week. I'm like, how's a healthy guy? And I was still working on it. At this point, I was living in D.C., uh -huh. making great money. I had, I don't know, four or 500 employees. I was busy, but pop and Percocet like Skittles. I mean, this was before the um, opioid epidemic, so nobody cared, you know, they just thought- Oh, so it like, wasn't on the radar then, yeah? Well, yeah, yeah about it. not at all. Mm. A couple of my friends would be like, hey, can I have a couple, you know? And, and I'm yeah. like, yeah, fine. <laughs> <Yeah>. Wild. <laughs> and, uh, but I, I was just functioning, you know? I never put a needle in my arm or anything like that. And then, uh, you know, but other things in my life did start to fail, like I said, and a lot of it was pain as well. I mean, I just mm. couldn't. I couldn't do anything without wanting to kill myself. And I wanted to die. And it mm -hmm. did get to a point where I attempted suicide. And my mom was one mm -hmm. of those things. My mom lived an hour and a half away, had a bad mom feeling because I hadn't answered my phone in 24 hours. Sent wow. a police for a welfare check. Wow. And I had tried to, I could, I tried to OD, couldn't because of my tolerance. So well, I so tried high. to, yeah. So I tried to make myself hypoxic and stop breathing. And the uh, EMS came in and woke me up before I could die, before I could kill myself. And it was just because my mom had a gut feeling. And yeah. after that, she's like, we're getting you the help. I was like, right. oh, you know, I, okay, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, I need help yeah. now. And uh, like we were saying earlier, she, they, first they took me to a local rehab in Virginia. And they, it, you know, I'd never heard of AA before. And again, like I knew a couple people in college that had failed out and had to go to had get help. And mm -hmm. I kind of was always like rehab for quitters, kind of like, yeah. and I even yeah. had a Betty Ford clinic hat as a joke in my fraternity house. Like, wow, brilliant. <laughs> I wish I still had that hat. <laughs> yeah. You know, alumni of any Ford. But, uh, you know, I, I, did, I get my first rehab. I, I literally, I walk in the door and these people are chanting. And it's just like everything I'd ever made fun of and everything I just was like hokey pokey, like weirdness. All the cliche and, right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right there. She hands me, and I try to say something. She's like, you know, 
all right, whatever. She's like, not to you have the chanting stick. And yeah. I'm like, okay, you're losing me now. And I, and she's like, what are your goals for being here? I was like, uh, I just, my, I'm in a lot of pain and I just want to be able to go out with my friends and drink again. And they all laughed at me. Oh, <laughs> and yeah. I, I didn't even know what to think of that. I was like, I don't know, is this funny? Because like, yeah, why you know, is this funny? Not, like, I, what's, like what, part, what, what part of the joke am I missing? I want to laugh. And she's like, you'll never be able to drink again. And I laughed at her. <laughs> I yeah. like, no, you don't understand. What? You're my goal. Nobody tells me what I can't do. What yeah. I get my goals. And that's my goal. I will get there. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you were being honest. I mean, literally, yeah. you were being honest. Yeah. Honest. Mm -hmm. And like, they, had, they didn't have the capacity. It was just because it was, you listen to us and it's our way because it's the only way that works. Yep. Mm -hmm. But don't you fail like 90% of the time? She, they've tried to give me some statistic and I'm like, uh, you know, guy, so I can, yeah. blow, you, there's, everybody can blow holes in any statistics. Anyway. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And the fact is, is unless you're in jail under 24 seven supervision, we just exactly. don't know. We do know we yeah. fail a lot more than we succeed. So Absolutely. I can tell you this, and this is something that, and, and I can, I got this from one of your, one of years earlier was one of the things that I found myself, and this is a problem I've got to deal with now is COVID hasn't affected me that as, as much, I think, as others, because mm -hmm. I've stopped making new friends on purpose because they die. Yeah. When you work in the industry or, you're, you know, you're making friends that are coming through and are six-month clients and you're still trying to help them. And I, I just got so tired of going to funerals that it was yeah. like, I don't want to get close to you. And it's like, I, I mean, I, I've been single for so long now. It's pathetic just because yeah. it's like, I don't want to deal with the headache. And like, I sleep in an adjustable bed. So it's like upside down half the time with all my <laughs> problems. But um, yeah, I, I, and I finally just had enough issues and was fed up with it that my, my mom was like, look, everybody's saying that AA is the way you have to do it. And that's the only way to, you know, it works. And, you know, please try it. And I ended up on, you know, seeing an addictionologist back then, it was just a psychiatrist calling himself that, who ended up giving me a boatload first of Norco. Yeah. Come on. Well, and then, yeah. yeah. Then he puts me on methadone and I, and I, and I don't want to come down on methadone because I know it heard people say it helps them. So yeah, again, we're all unique. We react differently. My body reacted like, give me more. It's getting me high. So yeah. yeah. I was escaping depression. That's exactly what I was doing was I don't want to deal just mm -hmm. ostrich, put my head in the sand. Everything's okay. You know, For that, sure. that was what I was going to do. So I ended up in California myself at a shady place. We'll just say that who, mm -hmm. Uh, defrauded my insurance heavily, kept me there for as long as they possibly could. My counselor admitted, because he said it every day, he had 264 days sober. I remember that because I was like, ridiculous. In my head, I'm like, uh, you're a counselor already. You know, I'm an intern. Like, you're a yeah. counselor at, two, like, at, at 264 is when you're like, maybe like doing habits for the counselors, you know? Yeah. Like, like peer support. I'll the maybe still, you know? Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, it just, anyway, I even do regular. Right and he did the whole, he did it perfectly and told my parents, I've had back problems too. I know what they're like. Everybody has had back problems. Everybody, not like, no, not everybody has a complete metal back. Like yeah. there's a big difference, right? Big difference. So yes. I kept saying, I was like, when I go to AA meetings, the fold out chairs make me want to go to straight to the ER because they hurt so bad to sit in. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, and, and, I, and on me, I would go to these meetings and look for differences. I, I'm not like you. I'm not like you. I mm -hmm. can't relate. Don't get it. And his first thing I heard I couldn't relate to, I didn't listen. I was done. I didn't want to yeah. listen to anything else. Instead of trying to take the optimistic approach is you can learn something from everybody. And I've taken yeah. that from an intellectual perspective, but for some reason I didn't do it in that setting. You were too new. I mean, you didn't know any better. You're hearing these stories of people that have these horrible families. It's just, just, just yeah. really tortured life. And you're like, I had back surgery. And everyone's like, yeah, but what else? And you're like, no, back surgery. Yeah. Like, yeah, but what else? And you, I mean, I would be very hard to relate to that, especially when you're like, your life's become unmanageable. Well, not really. It's just been the pain. Like, yeah, everything else is fine. But how much money have you spent on street drugs? I'm like, I don't, whatever my copay is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't know. hundred uh -huh. bucks, I guess. Yeah, yeah. But I, can't, I, can't even, I can't even comprehend what that would look like. I'm, when, a, I'm a little shocked that you, your friends, and your parents had enough awareness to even connect that that was addiction. Yeah. So many was, people just what? see the differences like that, and they just don't even look for help. They just continue to perpetuate that, mm -hmm. which is so sad. That's incredible. I had one of my 
he was my, my little brother in the fraternity, but one of my best friends, he actually came through my doggy door. And he's a big dude. <laughs> yeah. And I, luckily I had a lab, so it was a big doggy door. But my mom had called him and was worried. And he was like, I'm worried too. And he came through my doggy door and I was, he videotaped me to show me how messed up I was the next day. And he was like, this is not you. This is you. I've looked up to you my whole oh, life. That's and awesome. like, I'm calling your mom, dude. He's like, I'm telling you now straight up. And I, but that's I was awesome. so lucky to have friends and, a, and parents that didn't listen to cut them off and put them out in the street. Cause I was told myself. In a Let's talk about that for a sec, yes. Ryan, that tough love approach. And I remember what, you know, I've been doing, I've been doing addiction you know, counseling now for about 20 years. I've been you know, in recovery myself and healing from addiction for about yeah. 25 plus years now. And uh, the funny thing about that was when I first started in the industry, it was a lot of like tough love, just cut them off, just do that. And it never felt right to me because I'm like, wait a minute, no matter how much you say that, you, you're, you're never going to do that 100%. And if you do, that's almost to a certain degree signing a death certificate. Abusive. And so when you have a family like yours and, you know, your parents are like, we need to get this guy help. And where do you find it? You know, I mean, even now Google reviews and crap, like we owned our own treatment center. And I know that some of the reviews on there are full of crap and some of them are spot on. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you, you cannot, and I know other treatment centers that have amazing Google reviews and I go inside and I'm like, Ooh, this is yeah. not good. The, the amount of faith that your parents put into a, a program simply by name and maybe by look uh, off the charts at, at what point um, do you start noticing, you know, your, your counselor 20, you know, 200 plus days in, in recovery, <laughs> ridiculous. Um, where did you start realizing that this is weird? Like, like this doesn't seem oh. like I'm getting what I wow. need because this is bizarre. Like, where did it start kind of deviating off the track? Because then the, the counselor swoops in and starts saying, hey, your son, what he's doing right now is he's telling you, well, he's, he's going to tell you that they're not helping him, yeah. that the meetings Just are Just because he wants to go home. He wants to go home. And, and this place is going to work for him. Don't listen to what he's saying. Or like, or like a husband or wife is like, hey, when your husband calls you, he's going to tell you this place sucks and it's horrible. But you know what? That's just the addiction talking. Mm -hmm. How much damage can come from that? Because really what I want you to do, my brother, is help us teach these folks um, your perspective of it. Because we have our own, but we're on a professional level. Yeah. Your unique uh, ability to like see it from both sides now yeah. is so precious. Yeah, and it, it, it caused a lot of problems. And, and, and I'm, I'm worried, and I'll get on with the story more so between my, my parents, because my mom took my side because I'd always been a mama's boy. I was the yeah. I came along seven years older behind my two older sisters. So they both always resented me for being the spoiled younger favorite kid by my mom. And my dad was always kind of a, a quiet professional. You know, he's a VP at North of Grumman. He was an engineer. You know, he took a very logical point of view, but a very loving, very, you know, man. So it, his logical mind, whatever, was like, listen to the professionals. My mom was like, my son, I, I know something is wrong you know like mm -hmm. and so i know i i've never i never saw them argue <laughs> i know that's weird I mean, everybody else is like yeah my mom was beating my dad while smoking a crack pipe i never saw my parents like get in a debate like no yeah. yeah. no doubt they did it behind closed doors but like i said it was that kind of household i've been brought up in. i mean no, suck was a bad word i mean i was yeah. i was in trouble for suck you know so uh -huh. it was, it, I, mean, I yeah i was very fortunate to have that support because i did a lot of, uh, we'll just say other family. And um, the, the, the stigma back then was so bad. It was, oh, um, oh drug, he's a junkie. Junkie, mm -hmm. you know, like we knew this was coming. Look how hard he partied in college. It was like, yeah, mm -hmm. you. he lived in the fraternity house. I mean, he also got a degree, you know, in economics, not just psychology. Yeah, see? Mm -hmm. No offense or he didn't invite you guys, but I mean, like, no, yeah, you're right. Real didn't degree, fit the bill. You know, like, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I, you know, I parted my way through it. But yeah, no, then I, at this place in California, first it was, I was going to go there just for a month. Then I noticed that there was a lot of insurance stuff and I, I knew I had insurance, but you know, I didn't know under, I had a good job. I knew I had a good insurance. That was yeah. good. Well, they just kept extending it. Oh, guys, we got good news. We're able to help you some more. And they would mm -hmm. you know, justify it in one manner or another, move me to a nicer place on the beach. So I'm up on Laguna beach, got my own place. Now you don't want to go. I've got my own moped. You know what I did? I went to urgent care once a week and got my kid. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm not kidding. I, and oh, and nobody man. noticed that I was gone for three hours and, and I could just do it. And it was easy. And I wasn't physically dependent at that point. So I could just go and come as I please. Like, I was yeah. When my insurance finally ran out, I end up at what's supposed to be a sober home. And I'd never been to a sober home. 
and I'm introduced to this 20 year old punk little kid who's my roommate. And instantly I'm just kind of irked, but like, I was like, all right, make the best of it. I woke up the next morning and I saw heroin for the first time. He had his sleeve rolled up, needle injected, three uh-huh. guys sitting on his bed and they're all got needles in their arm. They're all tied up. And like my jaw dropped. I was just yeah. like, like, dude, Am I? like seriously, like this is like, I just walk out, walked out of the room. I'm like, I don't know. You punch all three of them at once. Like, I don't know. I'm just leaving you. Like, yeah. I just don't want these. And at this point, these guys were all like, trying to be tougher than the other one about I sleep with the gun under my pillow. And I, it was a world that I'd never seen, you know, like yeah. totally like weird and, and foreign to me. And my second night we got raided because the house manager was dealing crystal meth. No so, way. Yeah, oh, so man. Johnny coach said, mm-hmm. Oh gosh, bad luck with that house. I'll get him to another one. Second one. I lived there for two hours before I bought a bag of weed. Oh my gosh, man. From one of the house. Yeah. And I, I don't know if there was even a manager there. As far as I was concerned, it was a drop out, a crack house. Cause they yeah. were yeah. many are I've ever seen. Like, mm-hmm. I guess they were using crack. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I know they were smoking. I didn't know. And yeah. uh, it was like, he sent me to a couple of those houses and I finally was called my mom at a heart to heart. I was like, you really need to understand. A, I'm using it again. I'm back to full on. I found the pain management doctor who was like, wow, you must be in a ton of pain. And, and I was. He was like, yeah. yeah. I was like, but out here in California, they're much more liberal. He gave me, he was giving me like 120 Roxy's in the 30s and for breakthrough pain and then like 80 Oxycontin and then Ambien and Xanax. And I didn't even like Benzo. It was like, I just was like, they didn't do anything to me. Just yeah. And, yeah. Uh, but so I, so needless to say, I was taking a lot. And I, I was like, mom, I, this just isn't working. And my dad was basically kind of like, listen to that coach. We need to just cut him off. And that mm-hmm. night, I actually couldn't find a building in Laguna or Newport Beach that was high enough that I would I knew it would kill me. I was like, it's me. I'm going to live and just hurt. You know? Yeah. So I found train tracks. And I mm-hmm. thank God they were closed or nothing. But I, if a train had come, I was ready to walk in front of it. I was at that um, point where nobody believes me. I don't want, this pain isn't worth living. That's all, I couldn't hold a conversation. The pain was overriding. That's the mind-boggling thing, right? Is like, you know, any... Any any counselor therapist with a pulse could say, the, the, okay, there's he's he's being serious. Like there's yeah. there's signs and symptoms and things that we're seeing that, that's making this very true. We had a a client that uh, was in a horrible accident and his back was all kinds of messed up and and I remember him saying that same thing. The chairs, I can't sit on these chairs and yeah. and they're like, well, you've got to stay in group. And he's like, I can't. Marissa and I are like, why don't we go buy him a chair yeah. that I went he can and like bought him a recliner, you know? And and at first they were like, oh well, what what is he like the king, you know? Because he he was a he was a well known guy. I mean, he's very you know very popular in in his you know work of business. But I'm like, we're not doing this because of his prestige. We're doing this because he's human and he hurts. Yeah. And it was these small little things that we got criticized for. But he yeah, was like, thank you, you know, yeah. but it bothers me because all in the same breath, it's like, you know, you, you know, well, you would have got hit by a train. They, well, let's look at his UAs, you guys, and all your UAs would have come back hot and everything. And it's like, you don't realize that I'm doing that not to like suppress feelings I'm doing it to cover pain. And now I'm getting put in these situations of people that don't care. And I can't imagine, like, of course, that was one of your only options. You know, I mean, yeah. right. you weren't doing anything other than hurting in my yeah. eyes, that would that would necessitate like, you know, like like heavy yeah. duty therapy treatment, whatever. You're like, I need to get my pain under control, guys. But they could have yeah. spun it around to say, well, he's abusing, he's doing he's all this other stuff. It. And so, you know, that's why I think UAs are kind of stupid. UAs only, you know, prove you to, to be either honest in your recovery or dishonest. Yeah. And if you know your client well enough, you can see right off the bat, like, man, you're off your game day. You doing okay. Like your the yeah. behaviors tell you the story. Yeah. You don't need yeah. a piece Absolutely. of paper. Yeah, you don't need the UA. I managed some home rooms, so sober homes for a while, you know. <laughs> all, yeah, so all that stuff was just discounted. Yep. Yeah. See, all that stuff was discounted and they were like, well, everyone else is doing it. So Ryan's is part of that. I can only imagine the hell that you were put through, man. That's insane. Yeah, I, was, I swear to you, if training come, I was like, screw, you know, I, I've proved I can't OD. Like, you know, hypoxic, when I say hypoxic, I was taking dust off and I did, I'd done 20 cans. I was like, I know how to painlessly die. I'll go to sleep. I tried Ambien, whole bottle. Woke up like three hours later. That's, wow. That's how well, and and, and Ryan, on. Was that because the pain was so intense you couldn't get a grip on it that you were like, I'm not living life in this day. much pain. And everybody else is saying, Ryan's doing this because he's an addict. And it's like, no, Ryan's in pain. And so I had help. No, yeah. If I'd had people, the only reason I didn't were my mom and dad. 
that they were the old, I was like, this would kill my mom and thus crushing my dad. Not saying my dad doesn't care about me. My, my dad is such a logical person. He could always move on with life. Yeah. And I knew it was my, I have, I lost a cousin and it destroyed his mom, my mom's sister. And my mom had always said, just don't, please don't do that. Like I couldn't yeah. handle losing you. And I just was problem. like, you know, but at the same time, you guys are telling you know, me that, that I'm cut off or I'm, you, you want, dad wants to cut me off. And, you know, like, I don't well, it's know just that compounding, you know, it's the withdrawals. It's the, I can't do what I used to be able to do physically. And, yeah. you know, I can't be with my friends. I want to be isolating. So that's coming from the medication. So all this like piles up on top of each well, other. And you know what, and, Listen, I want the listeners to know that, you know, when, when you have a loved one that's in, that's in a situation like yours and there, there's legitimate pain, um, you've got to, you've got to have a heart to heart conversation, get, get rid of all the behaviors and everything else and get right to the soul. Like, tell me what's, what hurts, what's wrong. And you'll know if it's legitimate pain just by the conversation you'll have, you'll know if it's emotional pain they're trying to suppress by, by behaviors and things you know, that happened throughout their childhood, their life. But when they don't sit down and say, brother, what's, what's happening? What's going to help me understand. And they're just labeling you addict. You, you, you can't win. I mean, I'm, Ryan, I don't know how in the world you, you survived to, to that I got degree. very lucky, and, and, and to reverse a little bit, one of the frustrating things was before I knew anything about Suboxone or anything about that, uh, I had gone to two very well-known, we'll just say to this day, rehabs, where their doctors were like, you actually need to be on Suboxone long-term. Can you come see me after your, your, dis, your discharge? And I'm like, I didn't understand the question at first. Like, Why yeah, after? After your discharge, and no, Why I don't after? live in this state, you know? So they're like, ah, oh, because you're actually, you know, we don't like to do it long-term, but you're one of the people that probably needs to be on it much longer than seven. You're more than a detox. You're Smart. somebody who needs to stay on this for a while till we figure things out medically. They were, mm -hmm. These guys had written the textbooks, right? And they're being overridden by MBA's administration because we're not a mat facility back then, you know, now everybody is. Now I can barely get mine because everybody's giving it out like spittles. So they're yeah. really getting it, but, um, but yeah. And, and so it, 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 cuts, it cuts so many ways, but I was very fortunate because I finally had a heart to heart with my mom and I was like, this is not working. And she had found a place in Florida and Southern Florida that she'd been talking to people. She said, please go to this place, try it whatever, blah, blah. I went, it was another air or highway, but it was a good place. They had good counselors. Mm -hmm. They were actually cool in the way of like people that I, I would associate like my friends, you know, like right. yeah. I, I thought they were funny. Like we joked around, we had the same sense of humor. They weren't like counselors. Like I didn't feel like I was being cheated or, or skeeved on in any way. Like mm -hmm. they had good intent. And so right. even though they were A or the highway people, they could, they could see. It. So they kind of made a deal with me. They were like, tell you what, you never fully put your heart in the air right? I'm like, mm -hmm. admit it. I've never done the full steps yeah. 12 all the way and say that I 100% try to have. They said, do it for one year. And I was like, this pain. And they were like, while you're getting medical tests, getting diagnosed, mm -hmm. seeing doctors. Mm -hmm. I was like, that's fair. All right. And I, I did, I mean, I did the, the 90, 90, I did like 180 and 100, you know, like I was mm -hmm. like pushing my back. I didn't care. I was like, I'm going to get better. I'm going to do it for my family. And for the through these people are all I can do it. And at the end of that year, I was still sober. And I looked at, I called my parents. I was like, I, I'm about to die. I still would mm -hmm. rather die. I was like, and I don't want to say that because it hurts your feelings. And yeah. I can act like I'm normal on a phone conversation. But at the end of the day, even working a few hours, I had a pretty cushy sales job and I was good at sales. So I could leave, you know, I, pretty easily. And even that I was like, was so painful. I was still so miserable. I was just putting on a front. And yeah. that's when I went and saw a suboxone doctor and, I mean, seriously, it did, it's not like it just fixes the pain, but it helped mm -hmm. not to take the edge off. And yeah. I still struggle. Like, you know, this, now is the end of the day. I've been pretty busy. Yeah. I'm a day trader with stocks. So I'm, I'm uh -huh. sitting and on the computer a lot. I also drove to a, a, a neuropsychiatric clinic to meet with some people today. So I spent a lot of time in the car. So at the end yeah. of the day, I feel it. And, you feel it. I, I'm, I probably look exhausted. And I, when I have to end this, I'll get up and live yeah. hobble over but you know what in 2018 uh, you were, uh, there, my last name was ward of course and all my fraternity brothers had this threat this email thread and the subject line is god hates ward and it's a joke because yeah. it's like i've been hit by lightning twice in my life oh, i ran gosh. yeah that's a whole different story i ran over i had a drunk lady while i was in my 20s come through my windshield 
<laughs> and while oh I was gosh. driving down the highway, no getting way. headbutted. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> she somehow lived and then sued me in a jury trial. Like I have the craziest life and stories that has happened to me. But I always come out came out on the other side. I always yeah. came out on top. And so like, it always worked out. Well, 2018, I'm recovering from the final of what I thought was back surgery, right? right. Yeah. University of Pennsylvania, this top-notch neurosurgeon. You have to try out and be screwed up enough to be even seen by him. He wow. sees me, and it was like vindication. He looks yeah. at me and my parents and was like, how have you not killed yourself? Yeah. I'm like looking at this MRI. He's like, you know wow. you have a shred of metal? Because I'd had the metal removed that had been broken in my back. They didn't get all of it. He's like, you oh. have a shred of metal sticking in your spinal cord. Oh, He's my like, gosh. Wow. He's like, how many years is this? He was just like in awe. He was like, and I told him kind of like the, and I've been in the rehab and he's like, yeah, I bet. Yeah. <laughs> I bet you need it again too. He, you, and you could just see like my dad being like, wow. And my mom like vindication. And then like mm-hmm. I walked out of there almost like pain better. Oh, you mm-hmm. know, almost I'd already gotten the surgery because it was vindication, yeah. but I told you yeah, so. The, yeah. Rest of the family didn't take it that way because it was yeah. like the, harm had been done to the family name or something, you know? Right. Yeah. I, I never got in trouble with law. I never got in trouble with, the only thing I did with family was not be there. I, I didn't talk, I didn't go home, I didn't call, you know? Mm-hmm. My parents, I had to have some surgeries during births of nieces and nephews. My parents would, one would stay with me. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, go to them or they're going to get mad. You know, I don't need you. I'm, no, I'm just sitting here, you yeah. know, but yeah, they were good parents. So anyway, long story short is, you know, I, I finally knew I could make a difference. So once the Suboxone started, I don't know how long it was, probably I would say four to six months, the craving stopped too. And yeah. I was like, well, I'm still fat. <laughs> yeah. Like, it is still there. One thing and, at a time. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And so, but anyway, I'm recovering the back surgery and I'm not even kidding with you. I'm just watching TV and my ceiling fell on my head. Oh my gosh. <laughs> And, Bloody I, hell, man. I, I, and as this, 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 the, they had been renovated the third floor and there had been a leak and I was on the first and the second floor, a six foot section had come down on my TV, which then had come down on top of me. And it, if it had been a smaller frame person, I probably would have killed him. Yeah. Uh, a quadruple fusion. <laughs> okay. In my neck. <laughs> oh my gosh. So at uh, first I had, a, I drove myself to the yard, which was terrible, but I was so, I had such a concussion. <laughs> Can you fix this? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> wet white paint. <laughs> like I looked like the thing because like the, the ceiling, it was wet and it was, yeah. so I just imagine what I look like. Oh my gosh. People, and I can't properly communicate. All I could say was ceiling fell head. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't know what these people were thinking. And they're like, do you need pain meds? I'm like, oh, uh, <laughs> oh. I need help, man. <laughs> Oh yeah, they, they did it. They were like, dude, you got a broken neck. And uh, so anyway, uh, long story short, I got through that, uh, you know, and, and I didn't have cravings. You know, I, I took the, the night I stayed in the hospital, I took whatever meds they gave me and I, they gave me a script if I needed it. And I just used the Suboxone. My doctor, my Suboxone doctor was like, take double if you need it. We'll fill early. And wow. I did take double for a couple days, but I didn't need to fill early. So, yeah. Biggest problem is I need to keep a Suboxone in the car because I'll leave and forget. Take yeah. it. Mm-hmm. I forget yeah. all the time. And all of a sudden, I'm like, why am I sweating? Oh, oh no. You know, I haven't taken a Suboxone, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, but the, the back up just a little bit. After the ceiling fell on my head, I had the surgery. And this was December of 2018. I had the surgery. And my mom and dad came down here for it. And my mom was like having some pains. And she's like, oh, it's just stress or something. And she doesn't go to the doctor because she's tough. Her and my dad, after my surgery, they go to Barbados, celebrate their 55th wedding anniversary. Then they go home to find out she has stage four pancreatic. Oh That's what her pain was. So it wasn't stress mm. over me. Instead of going where she probably could have gotten it fixed and cut out real quickly, she stayed and took care of me and then went home and got the diagnosis. And so I quickly got home and I, my mom, is she was Miss Florida. And so she's always a beautiful woman, and she mm-hmm. a beautiful garden. And she always just like pretty things. Like that's mm-hmm. how she was. And, yeah. I, and she would never say anything about my weight. She would never have done that. But I knew I had to bother her. So I did the best I could. And I still at this point had a big neck harness on from the surgery. Yeah. I started doing bathroom counter push-ups. Every time I beat, mm-hmm. every time I went to the bathroom, brush my teeth, whatever. And then mm-hmm. I started out, dude, it was like struggling to do just a couple. And yeah. Her, by the end of... But before my mom passed and before she really kind of lost cognizance, 
I'd lost a hundred pounds. Wow. And I basically, a lot of it, I got to say was stress and from her and not, not mm-hmm. eating. I mean, if I basically mm-hmm. wasn't eating, all I could do was take care of her, take a break for an hour, go to the gym and then go to the bathroom. Every time I go to the bathroom, do a, at the end of it, I'm doing, you know, 200 yeah. pushups and I yeah. lost a hundred and some pounds. And so to this day, I still go to the gym every day, no matter how bad it hurts, because I know it's going to hurt worse if I don't. Exactly. And so, like, yeah. And you know, I, I've learned, you know, arms days, so I try to time it with meetings, you know, because the mm-hmm. arms are going to think lower back and I try different forms and and Rose, Smart. You help me, you know, and you're probably telling me not to do a lot of the things I do. And, uh, yeah. But in the end, it, it, it gets the serotonin going. And if I, yeah. I would, you know, I still, like I said, I, I had to find myself, I'm isolating again. I've just kind of realized that with COVID. Like my friends uh-huh. were doing Zoom calls and I'm, they're all like, this is so fun. They're married with three kids. So it's fun for them to do happy hour on Zoom. And I'm yeah. like, this is sad. This is the most social I've been in a long time. Yeah, this is all yeah. I got, man. You know, like that's, and you guys all have kids. You know? like, <laughs> mm-hmm. bad. So, you know, she made me reflect on that, but at least I can, I had my Suboxone doctor appointment today and we talked about it a little bit and she's like, why don't you see our psychologist? I was like, ah, awesome. We'll see, maybe. But that's the thing though. Again, I, I think it's a hoop because everyone keeps, you know, there's, they keep trying to paradigm you and put you into the attic frame of mind. And I think, now, we on team addict athlete we don't really we don't have our our athletes the folks that participate we don't call them addicts we don't identify you know in fact you know the one thing i got kind of uh kind of hit with 10 years ago when we started is you know how dare you not let them call themselves addicts i'm like it's a part of them it's not who they are it's it's a, it's a part of them now they're athletes and fathers yeah. and, and sons and yeah. scholars do and they artists. feed the addict or do they feed yeah and i think the if, we, if we focus so it's much on that labels in general yeah <laughs> if, if we yeah. focus so Human. much on that yeah, yeah. It's, it's, they, they become typecast into it. And then they have an excuse. Oh, well, he's the addict of the family, so we have to expect this. And and they the keep on sheep. trying to paradigm yeah. you into that and shift you into that. It's like, you know, I, again, I think that we, you know, as counselors, as therapists, I've seen this in treatment centers I've worked at, no one takes the flipping time. They, they, they have to check off their little schedule and they have to do a little note so that your insurance can pay for it. And then out you go. And I don't like the way the system's set up by which you are governed by insurance. And I mm-hmm. think I've had so many conversations with, with insurance and doctors where they want you to do like this call in and a couple of years ago, I was like, had to do a, a peer review, a peer review. and I'm on this peer review. And it's right before Christmas and new year's. And I'm like, if you guys discharge this kid, he's gonna die. I mean, he's still very much imploding here. And they're like, Oh yeah. Tell me, get them all the diagnosis, everything we were doing in therapy, everything. And they're like, okay, yeah, we, we understand. The next day, they're like, nope, he's out. Denied. And so we keep him there because we're like, dude, we care about you as a person. But like, I'm so frustrated with that. And then, you know, just the whole mindset of how they pay for treatment, you know, and it's, it's not, it's a broken system and And keep pushing you into that. Yeah. No, it's not. Not in, in any aspect. As a matter of fact, in a lot of the, I don't know, Marissa, if you saw some of my most recent posts, like I started throwing some bald health cocktails, as <laughs> I've been known to do. I kind of took air, AAC, we'll just say Michael Cartwright, when he commented trying to fight back, that was a huge mistake. Yeah. Yeah. Admitting that what I was saying, I had him, I had an insider the whole time feeding me his email. And mm-hmm. I had Jim Kramer because I'm a day trader, so I'm always tweeting with, you know, Matt CNBC. Mm-hmm. They, he looked at the stock. They called him the most immoral stock on the exchange right before they delisted him. Absolutely. <laughs> like, yeah. Cartwright still made like $50 million and his wife still owns half the company. So the guy needs, but regardless, uh, yeah. after that, I finally was like, I can make a difference. I can help. I have a unique experience in my background and I don't know what it is I can do, but I can help. So I started writing on LinkedIn, I'm writing the articles and I uh-huh. well, actually prior to LinkedIn, sorry, I opened the rehab or helped open a rehab, helped found a mm-hmm. rehab. And unfortunately, we were very successful in the beginning. We had a doctor who I've now found out doesn't even hold a medical degree. Uh, mm-hmm. She was there for two weeks and then quit. We thought, fine, and she just found another job, whatever. We had mm-hmm. another doctor come in. It was Dr. Mendez who replaced her who, of the famous Ray Chapman case. Okay. Mm, her partner, yeah. Ray Mendez, came in as our new medical director. So that kind of gets you where the story's going. Brilliant. Yeah. Since I have an econ degree experience in running PL, I was COO, and the only thing I didn't run was the billing. And, yeah. I, and I was like, okay, yet I mm. sign off on all the UAs. My name's going on the UA form. Well, one day, mm. you know, it's just form after form after form. I'm just, you know, initial, initial, initial. Sign, sign. 
or whatever. I'm like, okay, we're, we're still allowed to drug test them four times a week, really? You know, at that point, they were still able to abuse the system, so now it can't be used properly. Yeah. And they're doing it, and I look at the stamp. It's the doctor who we had worked with and quit the first two weeks. She never quit. She was still on the payroll. So, but I didn't know mm. that. So yeah, because they don't her, let you I'm see like, the finances. Yeah, and I call her and I'm like, Sounds hey, familiar. She, yeah. I thought she was legit. So I call her. I'm like, they're still using your NPI number. They're still billing insurance. They're not using your DEA number as far as I can see. But, mm-hmm. but the, NPI, the insurance billing is where they're, they're using your stuff. And she acted shocked. Oh, yeah. 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 She was concurrently doing that with 12 different rehabs. Yeah. Still yes. doing it. I went on all their sites, blowing her up. And I got a letter from the lawyer not saying, because I wanted to be sued for slander. I had a hard drive. I was like, take me to court. Please. I dare you. Uh, mm-hmm. I got a zip drive and a herd of people that'll put you to jail for life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The letter just said I was preventing her from keep making a living. Not that I was lying. And I, I, I actually oh my gosh. Lie. I said, no, I, I really would like you to sue me. I'm, not, I'm telling you now, I'm not going to stop. <laughs> yeah. It was worse because uh, about a year ago, I got a call from an attorney, a civil defense attorney. And I depose you about this doctor. Why? Yeah. A patient under his care committed suicide. Yeah, you could depose me. Yeah, and so at this point, I only knew what I said was that she was in on the fraud. She got away with it. Our investors are serving 15 years. So I watched my back closely. However, yeah. our CEO and our doctor got away with it. Our CEO and our doctor started a new treatment center that I quickly shut down and bankrupted. And now they're being sued. So I've got them pretty good. But the yeah. doctor, good deal. When the lawyer calls me, I develop a good rapport with the doctor on the phone. And he calls me. He's like, my God, just bringing your name up brought fright to that woman's eyes. She settled. Yeah. <laughs> and I was Perfect. like, interesting. I was like, and, and, I, yes. and he says, you're never going to believe this. He said, but she never got her medical degree. I was like, what? I said, well, oh I, I, you're not going to surprise me these days, but what? He goes, like back in 85, she went to like Guadalajara. I don't want to try to, I can't pronounce it. Some place yeah. like Dan Rather actually did a story. I don't know if it was 60 Minutes or Dan Rather, but yeah, for real, yeah. Not a story on this specific place the year she graduated saying they were selling diplomas. He said, I have her under oath uh, admitting she didn't even go to undergrad. She just went to this Guadalajara place to get her medical her degree, lied on her resume, got a residency at a large system mm-hmm. in Miami. And boom, she's been a doctor for 30 years. And now, so why would anyone question? Because it's been years. Yeah. And as a psychologist, she's changed her specialty five, six times. All oh, she, my gosh. Five dirty people in Florida. I mean, Florida's the fraud vortex. I mean, yep. you're going to hit someone that's greedy and looking for fraud. Oh she's got gosh. a fake medical license. It's gold. And yeah. So as, as you started seeing some of this stuff, because it's interesting, and this is why I think I, I, I love your approach is because mm-hmm. – you know, coming from the clinical side where, you know, working in the industries and all, all the stuff, you know, and, and having an opportunity to own our own treatment center. We didn't own it for very long, brother. We were in and out pretty quick. So I'm like, if this is how you guys are going to play this game, yeah. it's ridiculous. And basically the, 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 the three other owners uh, that we were high stakeholders in wrote us a letter and said, we don't want to play with you guys anymore because you're being mean. And I'm like, because we want to make our treatment center because amazing. Because we have standards yeah. and we want to have a standard yeah, of you know, and they, clients. Oh my gosh, it was so funny. They're like, all the clients hate you. You're, you're too mean. And I'm like, what? And subsequently, after they let us go, they kept bringing the clients to our, our addict to athlete program. Our community. It's a free community resource. And I'm like, and all the clients were like, where'd you go? We, we love you. What's going on? I'm like, oh, that's really weird. We, you guys hate us. But the same yeah. thing happened. It's like when I left, I'm like, you guys have zero clinical people up there anymore. There's no one there with a clinical license yeah. to even do therapy or whatever. But guess what? Their notes get signed by a clinician each time. Because they have one clinician that's one of the owners and he just signs everything. I've seen that all of a so sudden many times clear. now where, you know, I was just involved with another program outpatient wise and no, they don't have a therapist there, but they're all doing therapy group therapy. Yeah. I'm like, how? They have counselors. You? Okay, well, what are so what are coaches the coaches and yeah? What and are the that. initials? What's the degree? And I'm What's like, the licensure? But people really? don't know. No one knows. They don't. They don't get it. And I'm thinking, state of Utah is very focused on this, and they have people come down and do site reviews and all that. But then it started to hit me. It's like they make sure that there's nothing obstructing fire exits and they make sure that your smoke detectors work and they make sure that the fridge temperatures are all the same mm-hmm. and they check your notes that usually get done a week before they show up yeah. and are handpicked with, with what, with what uh, you know, charts yep. they want you to review. And then oh, it's yeah. like, we're, we're great. We're perfect. But we, where, where's the, uh, 
Like, where do they address client care, real client care? And no one does. And that's so they just see that they're certified. Effective. Yeah, they see that they're accredited and they're certified and that's good enough. Yeah. And it's, it's not. They try to, we're Jayco, we're FARC, mm -hmm. we're whatever. And I can bring up 20 rehabs that have been rated for every crime under the book. Yep. All those certifications. You know, legit scripts. Everybody was trying to be the new BBB of rehabs. And there's yeah. a watchdog group because, quite frankly, they, even if you had good intentions as a watchdog group, HIPAA. HIPAA is going to stop you from a lot of things. They can throw up the HIPAA flag. And then you have agencies like the DCF is in charge of licensing our rehabs in Florida. Mm -hmm. We we hired an auditor before, a, a consultant before we had our DCF cast so we could do our, our soft opening or whatever. She mm -hmm. was a very friendly lady and she you know made sure everything was right. And I had on my office board a whole schedule of we had houses in Fort Lauderdale, houses in Boca. So I had, you know, Fort Lauderdale text and 24 seven. That's a lot of people to schedule. You got papers everywhere and they're all over my wall so I can visually, you know, make sure 24 seven is covered. Mm -hmm. She comes in and she's like, rips everything with Fort Lauderdale off the wall. You're not licensed in Fort Lauderdale. You got to hide this. And I'm like, okay, what? Somebody yeah. like, yeah, you know, so many things were wrong with that. This is the auditor telling us how to pass the DCF. You get so yeah, much work. Get rid of this and then you can pass. And then she basically goes through and pulls out like you're going through a library file that was everything's lined up and she pulls certain ones out just a minute. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, I, I didn't, I didn't know what she was doing all day. You were new to the whole yeah. arena. Yeah. But yep. our, I noticed our Dirtball CEO was right by her side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Next thing you know, next week we get our, our DCF audit and guess who one of the auditors who works for DCF is? Her. We just paid um. her God knows how much money to tell yeah. us how we're going to pass the test she's giving us next week. So like the guy who just got uh, all the movie stars were paying to get into college. I mean, she's doing the same thing. Doing you know? the same thing. Yes. Telling us how to pass the test. And I had put my Fort Lauderdale schedules back up in defiance. I didn't realize it was because we were breaking a law. I thought she was just being rude. So yeah. I, oh she came in my office and was she's like, swoop, I mean, just tore them off the wall. was like, do you realize if she had seen that? And I'm like, no. Yeah. What would have happened? What's going like, on? And that right then and there, I'm like, I just started questioning everything. And it was like, then we had a patient die over a decision that you said earlier, like, should, should yeah. be discharged? I'm an economics guy, not clinical. But right away, I almost laughed at the question being brought up. I'm like, yeah. I don't know. She yeah. died that night. And I'm just like, oh, mm. man. it's because See? she said she was going AMA if you didn't let her go for a break. She wanted one last run. Like, how many times do you have to see it? You know, like we've seen yeah. this before. Yeah. <laughs> like we, they had the nerve to send marketing people to her funeral. Oh, man. Oh, my gosh. I, I was just yeah. Like, man, like well, the scum of the earth. <laughs> you know, and, and I'll be honest with you, brother. One of the only reasons that I think, I mean, because the, the athlete that passed away, she meant a lot to us. And um, I'd worked with her for years when I worked for a government program. That subsequently, the government program I worked for, where I started Addict to Athlete, it was probably the best program I ever worked for because they bloody had standards. And we had, we had supervisors that were critical about making sure notes were in. And they were, you know, standard of care. Yeah. It's, the private, it's the private ones I had started having problems with. I'm like, why are you guys cutting corners? How come we don't have these things in place? But because I had this long relationship with this athlete and her family, because they all participate and still do with the team, um, we, we got each other. And so when she passed away in, in our sober living on my watch, I was, I was ready to throw in the towel with everything. I'm like, if I can't save this kid who I've had an amazing relationship with for five years, what am I even doing being here? And uh, I, I was just blown away by the stupidity and some of the, some, some of the arrangements that were going on. Like literally there was, there was a lot of avenues that could have been checked and rechecked that, that could have helped. Yeah. She um, had, she had Vivitrol at our medical clinic in the fridge. And, and the thing was, it doesn't I, help if I had no idea she was even her. looking into it because the doctors and us didn't talk and communicate. And I'm like, you know, it, it, it happened and it, it's heartbreaking. And I learned a lot, but then when things started to go down where like, when, when marketing started coming, when all those changes started happening, right? When we couldn't go out and like market the way we used to. And you can't broker all we, your clients we found out that shop uh, for clients. We found out that a lot of our clients were just, yeah, they were like taken from one treatment center and brought to another. And then we started having repeat people coming in and I'm like, something's wrong. We keep seeing the same people coming to the same place over and over. And we keep seeing you know, like, oh, this, re this facility's, you know, referring this person here. And I'm like, we're playing hopscotch here, guys. Yeah. What's the problem? And then when the revenue started going down because the main uh, subsidizer of, of insurance started to pull out, 
all of a sudden we're like, hey, you know what? We're, we're not making money anymore and our bank accounts dwindling and our finance gal is not telling us what's going on. Marissa was the CEO of the company and they were holding things back. And so we start asking questions and she gets attacked for being, how dare I? How ask. dare you ask a question about finances? <laughs> yeah. You know, and I'm like, what? The whole thing was weird. Then we got the thanks for playing card. And I walked out of that place thinking, you've got to be kidding me. Like, yeah. this is it. And I've talked to you and other people that yeah. have had, and I thought we had a, a unique situation and nothing, you know, maybe, maybe it's just the situation, but no, man, it's the mentality. And I'm like, what do you, what do parents who have kids in your position yeah. or, or, or the public at large, what do they got to look for? Because there, there are some very good programs in Utah too. There's some very, Absolutely. very good you know, private companies that I would say I'd be happy to work for. But there's others that I'm like, how the piss are you still operating? What, do, what would you recommend? Because you have a good, you have a different approach. Mm -hmm. We're clinicians. And so no matter where I go, I'm going to give it my 100%. Yeah. But like you come from a different perspective where you went through it. And yeah. then you, you, then you've been a part of it. So mm -hmm. what is, huh, what is your yeah, advice? On what the is other your hand? mindset? Uh, but, well, a couple of things need to change and it needs to be a paradigm shift in my opinion, a complete paradigm shift in the way. Agreed. Um, and, and, and it almost needs to get to the point where they, and I, I've been trying to get, I've met with the drugs are under Trump and I've got nowhere with that. And, and I'm, I'm trying to get to Jill Biden, hoping maybe she has some, some type of sympathy being a doctor and a mom of Delta. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> It, it, like what Trump did with the Parkland shooting kids, I thought was a good idea. Because he listened to the kids. But yeah, first time in history. Thought, so why don't you listen to the addicts? Instead of the CEO of Betty Ford making a million, yes. everybody should be nonprofit. Yeah, make a million a year, it's easy to say that. Or Clean Slate, whose board is loaded with Patrick Kennedy and the president of ASAM. So like, it, it's so swampy, even in our community, you know, like a... Yeah one who could afford lobbyists and we're backed by big VC money and have the instant, you know, the piggy bank and clean slate, I think is probably one of the best facilities out there, but the accreditation process of being able to own a rehab, some States overdo it. Some States like ours, Under. they just don't do anything. I mean, Dumb I, I, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I know I have a friend who doesn't have any type of degrees or diplomas, but he is a good counselor. So I know because he's been through it. So, but he, his, his company thinks he has a master's they never checked. I come from the recruiting industry, man, and I worked in DC where we had to get top secret clearances. And so like, I mean, we really checked resumes and I need mean, every yeah. dot and eye on your resume. Like we had to make sure it was legit. And like my college has, I graduated in 99 and 2000 for some reason. So like that, yeah, they would call me, they'd call me back. They'd be like, hey, hmm. you graduated in 99. They say 2000. I'm like, call them back and ask for 99 and they get it right. You know, like, yeah, yeah so, yes. but they, they check these days, they wouldn't even consider it. You know, it's like, no question. I ask you where you went to college months after you, they hired you. It's like, why well, Bob should have just put Harvard MBA on there, you know, like, mm -hmm. yeah, ask for more money. And it's just pointless. But I, I would scrap the system, the accreditation process, the watchdog process, it needs to be done. Parents need to know. And this is one of the things I've done. It's I, I, why I've stuck with day trading and I'll occasionally consult with rehabs is I don't hold a financial agenda to this. So I want people to know that I'm not biased towards it. Everybody's unique. The first thing you should do is go to a private doctor in your area and one that is, you know, look at their reviews, do some research. It's easy to do your own betting on, 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 on YouTube these days, but you can't yeah. listen to, you know, we have unfortunately some of the rock stars of our community who've sold out. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, uh, I agree. Some of them are my friends, and, and I'm sad to say they, they've taken the big salaries and worked for the generic 1 800 numbers. Who, Chris, I don't know if you saw, but I, I, I called, did. I, I called one. And that's what made I, me I, so I, happy I, about you when, I, when she showed me that. And I'm like, oh, this guy is awesome. Times, and not one person that's a watchdog person or Jayco, they didn't call me, but that video got passed around ridiculous amount. As a matter of fact, I just had one that I had posted throwing another Molotov where a guy in Florida, you're legally only allowed to be the clinical director of one facility, one clinical director, one for one, that's it. Mm -hmm. Medical directors, they finally were four, but, that's, but regardless, mm -hmm. there's a guy that I know, he, you Google his name and he's medical director. I mean, I mean a clinical everywhere signs up, he doesn't hide it. So I put it on LinkedIn. This is somebody I have something against, something that I had known had been a predator on women and he's a sex addiction expert. I've gotten a lot of private information on this gentleman. So I finally just was like, look, you advertise as this, this, and this. And I tagged every single facility. There you go. 
I mm-hmm. did it on LinkedIn is because in Twitter, Facebook, there's trolls. And I got tired mm-hmm. of just answering trolls. If you know, yeah. Yeah. I love people to debate me. And I love to learn new things because I know that's, I, you know, I've learned a lot of things like the Liffy Roy, the MSNBC consultant for, she started commenting on my stuff. Brian, brilliant. On my stuff. They'll disagree with me and put me down, but I like it because I learn from them sometimes. Yeah. Well, you I went hear that different perspective. Was like, you're right. You're, you win, you know? Awesome. It was all respectable. But Ryan, that mindset is why you had your 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 Florida licenses on the wall because if it was wrong, you want someone to come in and say, "Hey, if you want to do that, let's get you the right paperwork let's to make do it, it legit." Let's do it the right way. But they're tearing yeah. it off the wall and so, saying, and, "Just hide it." So, yeah. so of course you like having that. I like having that that criticism. I'm like, okay, well, it's going to make me better. You know, give us do a standard. job review. Don't give me glowing reviews. Show me what I need to improve on. Exactly. I love that mentality. It's just it's just using basic logic and having a I mean a moral compass that's pointing in the right direction and it's sad that I went to DC where I was like wow these people are horrible this is dirty you know to me now yeah. wow they're actually not very dirty you know I mean yeah it's swampy it's everything you see and they talk about on the news but mm-hmm. these are not killing people and stealing money and I really truly see it as the reason we're having the equivalent of a 9/11 a week in death still yeah 9/11 yeah. a week. And it's not being talked about is because there's more people getting rich than dying. Yeah. It's yeah. true. Whether it's the, the certification schools, the drug labs, I see accreditation more coming from the drug labs. They bring in duffel bags of cash. And a lot of that's changed now, but they're still patient brokering. The patient brokers moved to patient Pennsylvania though. They had yeah. relationships established. I mean, it's just, I actually had a guy who was a venture capitalist come down who bought several places down here and was going to hire me as a consultant. He asked me to write my job description. It was like, yeah, but we have to find a way. I know I can't pay you commission, but to be able to pay you on clients, you know, basically he was asking me to write up a loophole. Like, how do I mm. get commission without calling it commission? I was like, goodbye. Makes me so mad. Well, and I, so I many cinnamon invoice yeah. for my time, like just yeah. for talking to me. I was like, so many people do money. it. They just it starts to become the culture. And they also, because we saw that happen, you know, when we became when we took over ownership, we had a, a gentleman who was yeah, the client brokering us was, hey, I'll bring you clients for this much money. He had a website, and it was the first one you'd pop up when you Googled in Utah. Yeah, he had, he and he was didn't good at SEO. have a facility, but he had an awesome yeah. website. And so when you called to get someone in, he'd be like, oh, mine's full, but I trusted this program. Yeah. So ever can and I knew, more. I knew we were on a downhill when, when uh, some of our, our uh, other you know, board members on, on our team wanted to hire him to do our marketing. And I thought, yeah. no, I said, no, no. He's, He's questionable, but they're like, well, yeah, but he knows how to fill beds and we've got to pay our bills. We have to be able to pay our bills because we were struggling financially. (laughs) And I said, there's other ways we can make money. And maybe we're going to have to be super tight for a while, but we've got to do it ethically. And this guy isn't ethical. I can't trust him. Why would we bring him on to bring us more clients? And we cannot trust him. It's just sad that you do that. And a lot of times I'll tell the parents, I'm like, look, don't trust the first one you see on Google. I mean, they yeah. spend the most money on marketing and not on client care yeah. or on employees yeah. yes. they hire to take care of your child. So yeah. think about they that. They pay on said, SEO. Right. I said, that's, I said, I can make them a good SEO and do a paid, you know, Daniel's area that has 33 million followers on Instagram. He just got busted paying $25,000 a month to be fake followers. So it was like, wow, like he's playing. So it was kind of brilliant if you think about it. It's like, yeah. like thousand, I can make a hundred thousand in, in commercial. On the other end. Yeah. It's like, wow. I mean, it's just so much just dirty thinking. If people are that smart, go to a different industry. Go yeah. to a business where morals don't cost lives. You know? Exactly. Yeah. Like, you Absolutely. Know, like, this is where we got to pay the bills. So you're, that's worth someone's life to you? Or yeah. someone's second mortgage on their house at their one shot at rehab? That's, that's what it's worth. That's doing. the thing that bothers me, man, is because again, I knew even at the level we were giving up there, it wasn't enough for what they needed. Mm-hmm. I knew that we, we fulfilled the responsibilities that you know, the, the bare minimum requirements that the state had for us, but there was tons of stuff. Never had family groups, never had, you know, you know we just needed, yeah, I mean, we weren't making was, enough to hire enough staff to do quality high enough quality care for where we touched we did as best as we could best we could but again a lot of times we were just floundering because we had so many clients and not enough hands Mm -hmm. to try to cover and and it was it was it was never it was never a catching up thing it was you know we had more people drop out and come to addict athlete because it was free and they knew that we cared Uh, and that's you know i mean it's been amazing because that's kind of like a tribute to like you guys are invested you're doing this you know 
pretty much for free. Yeah. Um, yeah. We want to keep that up. But like, I'm like, you guys, we're not, we're not even touching half of what we need to do with these folks. Uh, and they're spending you know, tons of money. And now when we leave, you're, you're claiming you're giving them therapy and charging them that and you're not therapists. It just, oh, yeah. My therapist oh, went on vacation for a week and a half once while I was there because it was his time for vacation. I was like, but how about continuation of care? Like, why wouldn't you put me with them? You knew that was coming. He said he didn't. Yep. And so why not put me with a different counselor from the beginning? Oh, have somebody else cover. So yeah. you're saying the business is more, much, comes, much, comes much before anything else. And the majority of clients don't really get it because they're so out of it anyway. That they, they yeah, don't they don't notice. Yeah, yeah, they don't notice. Like, and yeah. And in a residential treatment center where you've got, you know, you know, 30, 60, 90 days, a week out is a lot of time. It's, you know, yeah. I mean. Well, and I find that most clients come in and it doesn't matter where they're at. It's better than, you know, on the street and where they've been living. They get three square meals a day. Somebody drives, you know, drives them to the gym. They have a chef. Yeah. Like, that's way better. So they don't even notice or look at or understand the clinical and therapy piece that yeah. that's got to be what you need really high quality to be able to work through this, not to just stabilize and be fed. You know, right. you can do that in the jail, but yeah, yeah these absolutely. other places Salvation you get a massage. Army. Yeah. yeah. Some of these yeah. others though, you get a massage and a pedicure. So obviously that's way better. You yeah. know, I have a friend that did the passages about 20 times. I'm like, don't they guarantee the cure? And you've been 20 times. They get like, yeah. Room there. I was like, ah, but it's guaranteed because yeah, he comes back right but that's the thing right is you start seeing this stuff that's underwriting i start seeing you know like like you know, treatment programs allowing clients to date each other and then you know staff building relationships that go really way well. overboard to the point where they're getting married you know staff and clients and i'm like are you guys serious you know i'm like this is so unhealthy no, that, no one sees it's it. out of control it's the wild west and i know some states have done it better but you know when i'm saying a paradigm shift Obviously, hospitals do it right. We don't hear this about large hospital systems on a daily basis, you know? I yeah. Mean, it, it, why? I'm, I'm at the point of just saying, scrap all the rehabs and just make them physically part of the rehab, especially the hospital. Already have We've been just That's exactly that. what I was talking <laughs> about. I, I see it being a dying industry, brother. Yeah, I really do. It's going to have to be because that's where, that's where it works. And the it medical should. model works. They can go there for detox, stabilization, and then you move on to an outpatient kind of a program where there can be real care. Yeah, and it's got what long term. It can't be 30 now. days and goodbye. Yeah. I, I would feel safe. I'm like, okay, I know I'm referring this person to a hospital setting where if they have a seizure from the benzos, the alcohol detox, there are all sorts of specialists that are close, you know, really yep. within walking distance close, not yes. going to call 911 because I happen to be the most that knows about medical in the room. That's sad when I'm the one that's the most, and I don't know CPR, but I, you know, you see what I'm saying? Like, yeah. Yeah. That, that, that I should not be the one that's, you know, handling that type of stuff, you know, or calling 911. There should be doctors and nurses calling 911, already stabilizing and getting mm -hmm. that information ready. It, yeah, and then I was, I was like, "Why well, just take them to the mental units? Because it's a mental problem anyway. Drugs are the symptom, yeah. but there's yeah. so much stigma behind it as well. And a lot of the ER docs and the doctors got tired of it as well. So Absolutely. They don't want to cover it. Either. And then getting to the real source of the problem, you know, medicated assisted therapy and, and and breaking down that stigma, harm reduction, and then it's therapists important. doing therapy, getting into the core issues, the stuff that hurts and bringing people and they're going to support it and, and kind of strengthen them. And, don't just teach them about addiction and, and continue how not to. to use. Absolutely. So, I mean, I, I'm with you a hundred percent and, and I hope Ryan, that this is just uh, one of many conversations we get to have yes. in the future, because Thank I'm looking too. at the time and I'm sure that your dad's probably like, are you okay? He's calling <laughs> me before we started, you know? So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up, but brother, um, there's, there's, there's amazing stuff you're doing and I'm, yeah. I'm an advocate. I'm a friend. I love the fact that you're doing this and when you know when i saw what you're doing i'm like i've got to talk to him because we've been on the other side of that too and we barely scratched the surface but do you yeah, have any I was excited when i started watching some of the ones i've gotten to watch today i was oh, like wow thank we, you. we really agree on pretty much everything a lot. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah this is amazing. how can people follow you how can the listeners yeah. who, are, who are listening to this, how can they follow you how do they reach out to you you know it's funny because i i had a, one of the hardest things i had trouble finding was something to do that I, was fun because like I said, you know, I still have pain. I still don't, can't go to, I don't want to go to bars and I don't, things like that. Or I'd love to go to concerts or shows still, but that hurts still, you know? Yeah, so like, yeah. I got into drones. It was kind of dorky, but I was like, I love You flying. kidding? Like, it's genius. Yeah. Dude, I mean, this, the technology is ridiculous. I have a drone for five miles. I mean, and I take yeah. four, I have a YouTube And those cameras. 
And yeah. it was like, they always said, live it in the moment. And I never understood what that meant because I'm mm. living in the moment. Like, what does that mean? Like six moments, right? Like that's living. Yeah, in that's it. <laughs> and I had to think to myself, I'm like, when in my life am I ever living in the moment? And the only thing I could think of was like, I grew up on the water, always driving, water skiing and driving boats. My mom was a professional water skier. So like I was skiing literally at three. Awesome. So wow. I was like, when you're driving the boat, you're, you know, especially if you're pulling a skier, you're paying, you, you I mean, you're have to be paying attention to everything. You're responsible for everything. And I always took that very seriously. When I was taught to, you know, it was yeah. in my head. And so that was living in the moment. Even if I was by myself, I was driving the boat. That was it. And when I got the drone thing, my mom always loved photography and that kind of bored me because I'm like, I can see that. But you can't see 600 feet up or eight miles up. You can't go that high legally. But perspective, is, is like mm -hmm. I, I could fly. I mean, today, I know this morning, I went down at sunrise. You know, before I had a meeting at Fort St. Lucie, I just took my drone. It was a nice morning, awesome. beautiful sunrise, and just for awesome. five, 33 minutes. I had the same battery. I went up and down the intercoastal, up and down the ocean, and took great video. Beautiful. Oh video. man! But like, I've stayed away from Facebook and Twitter for the most part, just because. Very wise. I want to deal with the trolls. I don't, I don't mm -hmm. answer them. I don't reply to them anyway. If I mm -hmm. simply like, if you want to discuss this intellectually, please do so. I'm up yeah. for the debate. And people who do it on LinkedIn, it's funny. Now that I've started making videos on LinkedIn, yeah. like you, said, you guys have had a lot to say about, you know, people with a lot of initials behind their name. Erwin yeah. Suboxo, come live and talk to me. Let's have this intellectual life we're doing right now. Yeah. You tell me why you think it, and then I'll tell you, I've taken 12 milligrams today. And have you ever seen it? And I've been doing it for eight years, the same mm -hmm. amount. And I'll have all the pharmacy records and doctor records to prove it. Have you ever met a heroin addict that can function this long and stay on the yeah. same dose every day and all, no. commonly forgets their dose? Yeah. No. Like, mm -hmm. and, and then just show. And like, why do you believe what you believe and then talk to someone like me? And I actually have yeah. a friend who truly believes someone just poked in behind you. <laughs> I have a friend. Awesome. I, I have a friend. I'm sorry. But you're yeah, fine, fine. he truly believes. He's like, you are like the only person. He's like an AA or the highway person, but I'm the only person Suboxone no. is good for. I was like, oh. Yeah, but you know, whatever. See, no, but 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 that that's great. And so, <laughs> listeners, you've been you've been well educated today, and and uh, you know, uh, thank you, Ryan, for putting your neck out there because I know how how sensitive it is, but I also understand the complexity of what we're dealing with, and and if we can be of any asset or resource to you as well as you're as you're advocating for this, please remember us because please. we've uh, we, we've 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 done a lot of stuff in in Utah and kind of grown outside of the scope of just traditional you know twelve step meetings and whatnot. Yeah. So we like, like advocating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and you, I mean, the, having that platform and just the, the voice to be heard and let more people hear what we are saying, that's the key. We're the yeah. people that have the financial agenda. We just want people to get better. I've been there. Like, cause so I, yeah. I get where your kid has been. So that's why I like, I have compassion. I can go for Stryker or Medtronic right now and make a very nice living doing very little. Maybe yeah. MRI machines. I know enough about them. I've mm -hmm. had enough to glow at night, but I, I actually care, you know, like, and I know yeah. that I can actually make a it difference feels. by telling my That's story, awesome. you know, so I, this, one of the things that terrified me is I get I, a lot of documentary people because everybody's doing it these days, ask me to do something for whatever. One of them was asking about putting that film into it. And his film is focused on a specific cartel owning sober homes in California and a specific mob family owning sober homes right here. And I was uh, like, man, I got enough people trying to kill me. Yeah, I don't. You don't have the I best luck when it comes to just natural <laughs> yeah. disasters either. So, mm -hmm. I was like, I'm a big dude, but if we're talking about pissing off the mob and the cartel, no, yeah, thank you. Why not? I, I don't yeah. have kids, you know. I was like, but, <laughs> I was like, I gotta draw a line at some point. I already have people locally trying to kill me. So, oh we'll man, tell us my mom about because, tell us about your show and when is it coming out? Do you know? Uh, well, I've, I've done a few things. I've done one with Apple. Uh, Apple, is, they, they, they bought the rights to Whistleblower, that, that TV show, I think, on CBS. And I filmed an episode like six months ago. Mm. They told me a month ago it was filming. It was airing that week. and It hasn't aired yet. Um, but okay. they said there was a bottleneck in Apple TV and Prime. But that's just one episode. And I've just been kind of floating with what I'm going to do with it. I awesome. just wanted to be so careful with not coming at this with the financial agenda. You yeah. Know, like, yeah. I get 30,000 views on LinkedIn, but I still have to pay for my membership every month. Like yeah. I still, I just had a post taken down. I mean, you just saw that at 15,000 views and they take it yeah. down for censorship. Yeah. That's, that is what's starting to drive me to maybe do something like this. But 
Awesome. Just being able to come and talk to you guys that already have the platform. I like it. I can keep writing. Thank you. Awesome. I'll come on anytime you guys need to talk. I'm flexible. Oh, what's happening? Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm just Absolutely. sitting here thinking, all right. I, I, I Where like can we utilize you some mm. more sometime? <laughs> yeah. But listeners, you, 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 you've you heard it. And I think that this is a good a good resource for you to understand that, that you've got to do your homework when you're looking for any kind of help or any kind of resources. Don't just go with what's glitz and glamour. Go for, you know, the hard, ask the hard questions. You know, I, I say this all the time ask for treatment plans. You know, when you walk in, you should say, what's my treatment plan? You should know what you're working on. Ask for your treatment plan reviews. You know, look at your notes. Yeah. You have you have the right to see all those what things. The, on what's the licensure of the people that are yeah. working with you? Working, Absolutely. You know, running have a groups. checklist ready of questions to ask. And if they stutter, yeah, turn around. Yeah. Abs absolutely. And it, it's been the funniest thing to watch this. And I've been part of youth treatment and adult treatment. I'm like, you've got to have that stuff in, in place. And if not, and it's, and it's got to be unique. It can't be cookie cutter. And so I think that there's a lot of stuff we can do together to help bring more awareness as to what you're paying for and making sure you're getting yeah. your family yeah. member back and getting your life back on track. So, absolutely. Ryan, okay. thanks well, again, thank brother. We appreciate so you. you. I, really, oh, I look forward to following more, more and being part of your organization. So, other awesome. Thank you. So, athletes, you've been well fed. You can, uh, can, <laughs> can laugh. Awesome. And so, until next time, go turn your mess into a message.